You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome from the Kennedy Space Center. The Space Shuttle Atlantis is on the launch pad, pointed in the right direction, marching toward what will likely be her last mission. The crew of six, led by Commander Ken Ham, is headed to the International Space Station to deliver some supplies, replace some solar array batteries, and install a new satellite dish. The shuttle was cleared to fly after a smooth flight readiness review. The team focused a fair amount of time on some ceramic inserts that hold window frames in. One of them fell off during the last descent of Discovery in April. The fix? A thicker braided cord designed to keep the insert from unscrewing. Interestingly, mission managers say there was no talk about it being the last flight for Atlantis. The tone of the meeting was extremely positive. Uh, nobody mentioned, and it wasn't, it wasn't uh, purposely avoiding it, but nobody mentioned this was Atlantis' last planned flight. It's just folks are so focused in, in, in doing their jobs and they're performing with such pride all the way to the end, you know, that it's, uh, it's just normal business. And the team's very mature and is looking at the data and, and uh, looking for things they can do. It's, you know, you might ask, well, did you really have to go and replace all of the braided cord on all of these, these plugs, which you've performed pretty well in the past? And the answer was, well, we think we'll make it better. And, uh, and because it'll make it better, then, then we're going to go do it. And, uh, and that's, what, that's the kind of attitude this team has. And I just, they're such an asset to, uh, to human spaceflight, and, and uh, I just I could not be more proud of them. In fact, here in Florida, the shuttle team is moving through the stages of grief. Let's take ourselves back in time of maybe a year or, or 18 months or so where, when we were talking about the end of the program, and, and a lot of people didn't believe it and, 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 and were in denial. They thought, well, heck, you know, the program can't end. We're going we're gonna to fly forever. Well, now we know that's not the case. The program will end. Um, people have absolutely come to grips with that. When I talked to the, to the folks on the floor of the processing facilities, and I'm sure it was the same at Math and in Utah, uh, they know the end is, is coming and they're making their plans. And so it, we've gotten past the, the denial stage of, of change, and we're into the, we're into the exploration and the acceptance change. And, and that's good. That's very healthy for the people to, to go through that process. Um, and we're there. Again, that, doesn't, that does not change the way they work on the vehicle. It's just, it's just their, their, their mental capacity to have accepted the fact that the program is going to end and they need to make plans for the future. Atlantis is slated to launch Friday at 2.20 p.m. here. That is 18.20 GMT. Our live webcast on Spaceflight Now begins at 9.30 a.m. That's 13.30 GMT. Whatever the U.S. flies into space after the shuttle fleet is done, you can rest assured it will include some sort of crew escape system, which was conspicuously absent on the space transportation system. And one notion for one capsule that might not ever fly for real got a good testing this week in New Mexico. Check it out. Five, four, three, two, one, launch, launch. This is a solid rocket motor with a half million pounds of thrust designed to pull an Orion capsule away from a rocket that has gone awry. This test did not go awry at all. The capsule went from zero to 450 miles an hour in two and a half seconds. That's a kick 16 times the force of gravity. One of the things about these tests, it's we do a lot of testing on the ground. You test motors by themselves to see how they work. You test computers by themselves. But what, what this test, why it's hard is you put them all together you take your computers, you take your attitude control motor, and you decide to accelerate them at 15 Gs and blare them with 163 dBs, and they all got to work. And the team did such a flawless job today, it worked great. And so it's a huge step for us. So. The escape system is part of the Constellation program, which, as you know, the Obama White House wants to scrap. So this abort motor is facing an abort scenario of its own. SpaceX is on the calendar here to launch its Falcon 9 rocket for the first time on May 23rd. But it might go even sooner than that. They're on standby for May 16th and 17th as well. The company requested those dates in the event that Atlantis gets off the pad on time and allows them some time to turn around the range, as they say. The Falcon 9 is designed to carry cargo and eventually humans to and from the International Space Station under a commercial contract to NASA. One of the great legends of the Apollo era has gone west. Gunter Vent, the pad leader who tucked Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and shuttle astronauts into their spaceships, 
died this week. A German who became an American citizen, he was known as the Pad Fuhrer. Remember the line in Apollo 13, Tom Hanks playing Jim Lovell asked, I wonder where Gunther went. Well, he actually never went too far, dying close to where I stand at his home in Merritt Island, Florida. He was 85. There is a new kind of space race underway, and it's all about who gets the bragging rights for sending the coolest robot into the void. In Japan, engineers are planning to send a two-legged robot to walk on the surface of the moon by 2015. They had been thinking about sending a wheeled robot, but they decided a biped would be more fascinating and stimulating. Their words. The Japanese claim to be robot leaders, but they better be careful about saying that around this guy. Robonaut 2 is a humanoid robot built at NASA's Johnson Space Center. He is slated to fly to the International Space Station in September. His legs aren't going, but he won't need them in low Earth orbit. So how about a game of Rock'em Sock'em Robots in space? Scientists came one step closer to solving the riddle of how our humble planetary abode got all of its water. Two teams of scientists using a NASA telescope in Hawaii found water in frozen form on the asteroid known as 24 Themis. And not just a little ice, a third of that space rock is covered in frost. They also found organic molecules. So was it an asteroid collision that gave us the oceans and perhaps the raw material for life? Maybe so. The discovery also validates NASA's new mission to send astronauts to an asteroid before staging a mission to Mars. The discovery has blurred the distinction between asteroids and comets, which are often described as dirty snowballs. Short of sending humans, the holy grail of Mars exploration is a robotic sample return mission. Rovers like the upcoming Mars Science Laboratory that will analyze samples in situ, as they say, can only do so much. Researchers would just love to have some Martian rocks to put through the analytical mill in a lab here on Earth. But it's so darn complicated and expensive that it has never moved from dreams to reality. But the man who runs the never-ending Spirit and Opportunity rover campaigns says the way to go is to break it all down, make it three separate missions. Steve Squires laid it all out at an astrobiology conference in Houston. His vision, first a rover that goes to find some interesting rocks, then a lander with a return rocket arrives nearby. It carries the sample toward Earth. And finally, a craft would rendezvous with the sample ship and bring the rocks back home. Easy peasy, right? Oh, one other thing. NASA is teaming up with ESA to share cost on this mission. Are you listening to this, human spaceflight team? Seems like a good excuse to check in on Squire's diehard rovers now. Opportunity sent back this image the other day. It shows the rim of the Endeavour crater, the rover's destination, in its multi-year trek across the Martian desert. The crater is about eight miles away. It is about 25 times wider than Victoria, where Opportunity spent the better part of two years. By the way, Opportunity's odometer hit 20 kilometers the other day. No need for an oil change or tire rotation, however. Let's see, 12.4 miles over 74 months. That's about .0002 miles an hour. Spirit is still doing no miles an hour. Stuck in the sand, in hibernation mode until spring, we hope. ESA's Herschel Infrared Space Telescope is marking its first anniversary and giving us a nice gift. This is the Rosette Nebula, about 5,000 light years from us. Using infrared, Herschel can see dust. The bigger ones are cocoons where massive embryonic stars, 10 times our sun, are forming. NASA's Chandra Observatory captured an X-ray image of a double black hole in the M82 galaxy. This is the first evidence that more than one mid-sized black hole exists in the same galaxy. This may explain how supermassive black holes ultimately form. Now, M82 is about 12 million light years from us. It is a young galaxy, giving astronomers a chance to see how stars form. Here's a grade B space thriller that is not coming to a theater near you. It's called The Attack of the Zombie Sat. We're talking about a rogue bird named Galaxy 15. It is adrift after solar flares fried its electronic brains. The Intelsat satellite is still transmitting as it drifts, and there's concern it will interfere with other satellites. Intelsat has tried to shut it down, but it seems to have a mind of its own. You hungry? How about a bite of Yapetus? 
Looks like someone has already taken a bite already, though. Check out this image of the Saturn moon snapped by the Cassini spacecraft run by NASA and ESA and the Italian Space Agency. Iapetus has a dark and a light side. Maybe we need to get it some meds. And now the weather forecast for Saturn. And in a word, it is stormy. And holy cow, it is one humdinger. It is a blizzard five times larger than the so-called Snowmageddon storm this past winter in Washington, just to give you some perspective. And here's what makes this even more fun. It was spotted by some amateurs, led by an Australian by the name of Anthony Wesley. He spotted the dark spot. He gave a heads up to the Cassini team, which aimed its infrared spectrometer at the blizzard. Now, Cassini has been watching the Saturn weather in its storm alley. Yes, they have one for years. But the blizzards only last for weeks, and the Cassini spectrometer needs to be aimed months in advance. So it's good to have some amateur storm chasers on Saturn, so to speak. Next time on TWIST, the final scheduled launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis, targeted for Friday the 14th, 220 Eastern, 1820 GMT. Don't forget to join our live interactive coverage starting at 9.30 a.m. That is 13.30 GMT on spaceflightnow.com. Next week's show will be highlights of the final scheduled launch of Atlantis, and we'll return the week after that with a full roster of space news. Special thanks to our sponsor this week, Binary Space. We really appreciate the support. If you want to send us a note, shoot us an email to twist at spaceflightnow.com. Tweet us at This Week in Space, or meet us at the blog, milesobrien.com. And don't forget to stop on the PayPal link if you want to help us keep on. We do this basically as volunteer work, and we do it for love, and we hope you enjoy it. We'll see you for the next launch. Thanks for being with us.